Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, seminar uh, organized by HKUST's uh, Institute for Emerging Market Studies. I'm your moderator, uh, Donald, and it's a real delight to welcome all of you uh, from wherever you are uh, around the globe. Uh, today, we are extremely pleased to have with us the authors of this uh, wonderful new book uh, called Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia. Uh, I've asked, uh, they're all old friends and or colleagues of mine. Uh, it's great to uh, connect with them uh, over Zoom. One of the great things about uh, doing this over Zoom is that we can reach out to uh, participants from and audiences from all around the world. So, um, so let me briefly introduce to you our three authors as well as uh, the speakers in today's uh, seminar. Uh, we will first ask uh, Professor David Lampton, who is uh, the Senior Research Fellow at the School of Advanced International Studies, Foreign Policy Institute, and Professor Emeritus at Johns Hopkins Science. Uh, he was previously at Stanford University's Asia Pacific Research Center uh, till earlier this year. And for more than two decades uh, before 2019, uh, he was the Hyman Professor and Director of China Studies at the Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, after Professor Lantern speaks, uh, I will invite uh, Professor Selena Ho who is Assistant Professor and Chair of the Master of International Affairs Program at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, Selina is a good a friend and a good colleague of mine when I was uh, serving at the LKY School. And, and certainly last but not least uh, would be Professor Cheng Chui uh, Quick, uh, who is uh, Associate Professor and Head of the Center for Asian Studies at the National University of Malaysia's uh, Institute for of Malaysian and International Studies. He's also concurrently a non-resident fellow at uh, Johns Hopkins Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, so without further ado, I would invite Professor Lanton to, and, and his fellow uh, authors to talk us through this wonderful new book. Now over to you, Professor Lanton. Well, thank you, Donald, and uh, thank all of you uh, for uh, participating in this. And I do look forward, as I know my two co-authors do, to a lively discussion and we'll be as responsive as we can be. Um, I also want to thank uh, the University of California Press and its editor, Reed Malcolm, for having done a wonderful job in producing what I think and is a very uh, handsome, readable, and uh, high quality book. Uh, so in any case, I want to thank the University of California Press and of course, no project uh, of the scale and magnitude of this, which is uh, basically a five to six year project covering uh, eight to nine countries, depending on how you uh, count, uh, you have to take into account the financing of this. And I wanna thank the Smith Richardson Foundation, SICE uh, helped, uh, and uh, certainly Stanford University helped. Uh, it was a complex funding and administrative job to, to carry out a comparative project of this magnitude. And I want to thank all the people that made it uh, possible. Um, I think the first thing to say and help uh, sort of uh, frame why we engaged in such a big project is when you commit five or six years of your life, you have to have a, a reason for doing that. And I think uh, at least part of the reason that I would put forth as having motivated me was lots of talk about decoupling in the United States, lots of talk about building walls uh, against Mexico and immigration and so forth. And yet what seems to be happening in Asia and China's playing a role, but Southeast Asia has its own vision is something very different than decoupling. It's connectivity and it's building infrastructure to force growth forward. You build infrastructure and systems build into their infrastructure, creating growth, urbanization, uh, and so forth. So what attracted us is the whole notion of connectivity uh, as a different way and maybe a more a productive way of looking at things rather than decoupling. Uh, so I think uh, the dedication of our book sort of captures that. We said this book is dedicated to the proposition that building connections is the future. 
and building walls is the past. So I think this was in each of our own ways to be sure a kind of motivating vision as we put in the long hours of uh, interviewing, documentary research and so forth. Uh, now this book is, I, I think, very, very exciting in its, its own way uh, because it's the story of really not only a regional transformation, but in part it's a story about how China built a, a world-class competitive industry from about ground zero in the year 2000 to a competitive global high-speed rail system uh, industry that first built it in China in the first decade plus of the new millennium, and now is exporting that industry around the world. So it's, a, it's a, an example in effect of industrial uh, policy. But the other major point, and my colleagues will elaborate, I'm sure, is that this is, while it's often spoken of as being part of the Belt and Road Initiative, this is a vision that the colonialists in the late 19th and early 20th century in Southeast Asia had. It was adopted by the newly emergent uh, governments and democracies and modernizing regimes after colonialism, after World War II. And this is an idea not born in China, but is in fact born in Southeast Asia. And it was only the convergence of this Southeast Asian vision and the capabilities of China to provide money, technology, and sort of integrative capacity. So this is a, to the degree that it's a, an overall endeavor, is really uh, one that shows that Southeast Asian countries have their own agency. They're not just being acted on by uh, China. Now, this, uh, I put up, can we put up the map here? This vision is really, uh, uh, really quite striking. This is just a sort of, um, broad, there are many spur lines and other existing lines uh, that would be on a comprehensive map, but this is the vision of what we might call high speed rail and conventional rail, albeit much more uh, rapid and modern than many of the lines that exist there. And you can see up at the top is Kunming in southern China. And these provinces are desperate to reach out and tap the markets of Southeast Asia, uh, send tourists along these routes. But there are three routes in the vision. One goes through uh, Rangoon down to Bangkok. One goes down through Laos and Thailand uh, to Bangkok. And one goes really from Hanoi via Phnom Penh to Bangkok, and then they all converge to go to Singapore. Each of these three lines is longer than the American Transcontinental Railroad. And there's a extensive discussion in the book about what difference the Transcontinental Railroad made to the United States and how it might have similar effects in the context now. You will also note that Bangkok is the hub, in a sense, in Southeast Asia. And Bangkok and Thailand have their own visions for their centrality in the, what you might call the Southeast Asian connectivity uh, system. Now, so one of the purposes is to describe the vision and say where the vision came from. Another purpose of the book is, uh, quite frankly, can China do it? Uh, it's a very complex technological and engineering undertaking, but it's even more complicated in terms of the politics of dealing with seven Southeast Asian countries plus China's own bureaucracy, China's own provinces. And of course, there are big powers in the region and beyond, Japan, the United States, EU, that are all interested in this. So part of the story is just simply answering the question, can China do it? Uh, I believe the answer is yes, but slowly. And the final vision will probably take longer, cost more, and look somewhat different in the end than the map that's uh, before you. Uh, also, this book is really about what is, does China have a strategy? And if so, what is that strategy? 
And it's, it's a complicated story, but I would say Beijing has a vision of China as the economic hub and human and material resources flowing from China's entire periphery, of which the Southeast Asia is one part. There are actually six what are called regional corridors, and this is only one of them. Uh, but it's China as the hub for the movement of human information and material resources and political power. Uh, and so the, then there's another aspect, and that is, well, that may be Ch Beijing's vision, but how does this get implemented? And the reality is uh, China's a messy place and has lots of provinces, state enterprises, entrepreneurial individuals, uh, and it, the localities and companies give a dynamism to this. So there's a general vision, but a very spontaneous entrepreneurial aspect to this whole thing. Uh, I think a whole nother set of questions is how is this going to reshape the uh, geoeconomics of the, the region and of China? And uh, the long and the short of it is, is that I think uh, this is going to create an integrated regional economy, and that raises the uh, issue for the United States, uh, for India, for, for Japan, for South Korea, really for the global economy is how can these other parties participate so that we build balanced connectivity, not just north-south flowing towards China, but how do we build balanced connectivity going east-west from India through, through Burma, through Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and link up to Japan through maritime routes and South Korea. So the vision that China has is itself is a hub. And I think the challenge of the West and other powers in the region is how to balance this vision, not oppose China, not try to obstruct China, but to supplement and balance the structure that is being uh, built. Uh, now, uh, the rest of the book, uh, the, the book is organized in, in eight chapters, and my two colleagues will talk about various aspects of that, uh, uh, that organization. But certainly, uh, implementation is uh, one of the big issues. Negotiations a big issue. How did China and its partners arrive at agreements or why didn't they? And another very important question is what is the agency? Do Southeast Asian are, countries, are they just putty in the hands of, uh, of Beijing to be manipulated and so forth? Or do they actually sometimes uh, derive their own advantages and have their own le le uh, leverage over China. And I think what we find is that many of the states in Southeast Asia have substantial control over their own future. Let me just wind up by saying, you know, what are some of the other big issues that I think this book speaks to that are of uh, current importance and interest? Certainly one question is, what is the role of infrastructure in development? Uh, the United States uh, and the World Bank for many years, I think, took a skeptical view of big infrastructure, seeing it as dis disruptive, uh, imposed on societies with insufficient administrative capacity, uh, and that uh, you could easily get in a situation of insufficient revenue and excessive debt. I think the Chinese and the Southeast Asian leaders with whom we inter interacted believe that you build infrastructure and then these systems, these economies grow into their infrastructure. If you wait to build infrastructure until you have growth, you'll never get it. Build infrastructure, get growth and move up the modernization. So I think it speaks to this whole question of how do you get development uh, and what's the role of infrastructure? Uh, certainly another whole area is how, uh, how do Chinese people look at this? We seem to think that Xi Jinping orders, you know, 50 to $100 billion for a project and it just happens. Well, there are a lot of people and in institutions and provinces in China that, thank you very much, would rather build railroads or highways or take care of old people in China, not spending money on risky projects abroad, some of which are in Southeast Asia. So the book speaks to the politics in China and paints 
a much more differentiated picture of, of debate in China. We sort of have this Xi Jinping in charge of everything kind of model, which at one level is true and has to be taken into account. But in another level, China is a very messy political system. Uh, certainly a whole nother uh, issue is uh, uh, what are going to be the effects of this connectivity between China and Southeast Asia. Uh, we're all well aware of some of the environmental impacts, finance impacts, and so forth. But as China opens up to its world and becomes more connected and the, the whole issue arises, will China be able to maintain its own political uh, insulation? Will it become, is it feasible to think that China can become more closed in many respects to information, external control, at the same time that it's trying to open up to the rest of the world and open up the rest of the world to China uh, in the sense of it being the hub. So I think it raises fundamental uh, questions about development. Well, I've spoken long enough, and now uh, Selena Ho is going to talk about uh, both implementation of this uh, vision and uh, negotiating it. Selena? Okay, uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, thanks, Donald, uh, for organizing, and also uh, Carla and Joey for putting me all the hard work in setting up this session. Um, but, but before I go on, actually, there's one, one picture that we have to show uh, of the three authors when we were doing field work in Laos. And um, just to add on to what uh, Mike was saying, is that there are, uh, we actually did uh, interviews across uh, China and uh, seven Southeast Asian countries. So it's extensive work. And um, as you can tell that the fact that we have to do uh, field work across all these uh, countries in Southeast Asia, the viewpoints of smaller states in Southeast Asia is also very important in this scope. So this is where I'm gonna be talking about. And then I think uh, Chung Tri will be elaborating later on on uh, the, the, the diverse uh, Southeast Asian, uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, response to China. But basically um, there are two key issues I want to address. What, what happened during the negotiation process and uh, what happened during the implementation process. So, um, you know, in IR theory, we always talk about smaller states having no agency. Um, the spotlight is almost completely on the great powers when we talk about, you know, uh, on various schools of uh, uh, international relations. Uh, in this book, we try to do something very different. We look at the interactions between China, the juggernaut of Asia and the relatively smaller states of South Asian countries. So as we discover um, in our fieldwork, like in Laos, smaller states, secondary states have you know, agency. Um, there are theories on small states behavior, but it is actually not very well developed uh, in terms of um, uh, how much the, the literature has actually progressed. Um, we hope that actually our book will contribute to a greater understanding of small state behavior. Now, three conditions. Let me start with uh, the, the bargaining process, the negotiation process. Now, three conditions actually determine the bargaining power of smaller states as they negotiate with China. Well, the first condition is that size, wealth, and location actually matters. Uh, middle powers like Indonesia and Thailand um, and uh, also Malaysia and Singapore obviously have greater leverage than Laos and are able to negotiate better things for themselves. For instance, Indonesia was able to get the Chinese to agree to no sovereign guarantees for the project and a lower interest rate. Um, geography matters. All of the, the Pan-Asia Railway, there are three lines, the east, the center, and the west. All three lines need to pass through Thailand. I mean, this, this, this geographical advantage gives a lot of um, uh, leverage to Thailand in, in negotiation as well. So in fact, uh, in one of the interviews, one of our interviews, one of the uh, key government advisors actually made a very interesting remark about Thailand. Uh, he, he said, in quotes, Thailand is a beautiful woman who can wait to choose the best suitor. Well, basically that's a really interesting quote referring to, uh, he, he was actually referring in terms of suitors, he was referring to the great powers that come wooing at Thailand's doorsteps. Now for Laos, geography is not an asset. It can be bypassed in the east, right, by uh, Myanmar and in the west by Vietnam. 
So in fact, in our interviews, there was significant anxiety in Laos among Lao officials that the whole uh, Pan-Asia railway would bypass Laos. Now, the second condition that determined the bargaining power of smaller states as they negotiate with China is state capacity. Now, secondary states have more options when they have greater capacity. And we talk when this kind of capacity, we're actually referring to robust government institutions, civil society, rule of law, human resources, and uh, the ability to regulate and to monitor. Well, I mean, Singapore will be a good example of uh, a country with state capacity, and it's also not overly dependent on China economically. However, you have countries like Laos, which are heavily uh, rely on the Chinese economy and for technical expertise as well. For instance, the feasibility study for the China Lao uh, High Speed Railway was conducted by uh, the Chinese. Um, the third condition that affects the bargaining power of smaller states is that is the uh, domestic politics and public opinion. And uh, Ching Chi will elaborate more on this later on, but let me outline some points here. Uh, if we think of bargaining as a two level game, um, if you all recall uh, Robert Putnam's two level theory, right? Uh, the first level is international bargaining among international actors for trade deals, for all sorts of economic deals. The second level is bargaining among domestic agencies. And in here, public opinion plays a role as well. So you have leaders like Najib, uh, the former prime minister of uh, Malaysia and uh, the current president of uh, Indonesia, uh, Jokowi, they have been attacked for selling their countries to China as a result of these uh, infrastructure and uh, railway projects. And there are concerns uh, locally in these countries, in the host countries, whether locals will actually benefit in the end from these projects, whether the technological transfer is gonna happen, job creations are gonna happen. And uh, also the fact that when Chinese companies uh, come to these host countries, to this part of the world, they often bring in workers and materials from China, meaning that local workers local SMEs are being sidelined. There is thus a very big question of whether the economies of host countries actually benefit. So in a sense, this negative public opinion and unhappiness over Chinese presence actually exert significant pressures on the leaders of these countries. So if we were to come back to the two level theory of bargaining, at level two, the wind sets for solicitation, politicians are actually very small. Now this ironically actually strengthens their bargaining position where they negotiate with China at level one, meaning they can tell China, look, I'm putting my domestic position at stake here. You have to give me more concessions. Okay, so these are the three uh, conditions that affect the bargaining power of smaller states as they talk to China about the high-speed railway projects. Now, as we proceed from negotiation and then when uh, contracts are actually being signed, uh, there are new challenges that crop up when it comes to implementation of the project, meaning the construction phase of the high-speed railway. So as Chinese companies venture into Southeast Asia, they encounter problems and issues which they are not familiar with. Um, the kind, when they operate in China, you know, the, the system, um, the, the way that the that system works within China, they're familiar with that. But when you go outside uh, into countries with different political systems, with a very confusing array of actors to democracies, uh, with places with many veto points, um, it is not so easy for them. And it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of learning in the process for them. Um, for instance, let me give you a couple of examples here. Um, one of the things that they will encounter is decentralization, decentralization politics in, in Indonesia, especially when they're trying to acquire land in Indonesia. Now, um, land acquisition is the first step in any of the construction projects. So, this is very important, and this is actually the part where a lot of delays happen. As we know, um, Indonesia post-1998, um, uh, there was greater democratization, there was decentralization, where uh, the central government was actually weakened, but the local government, the local regencies actually became a lot more powerful. So when countries, when, when Chinese companies tried to acquire land from the local regencies, they encountered resistance. Uh, in total, there are 29 districts and 95 villages in West Java that are directly impacted by the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway construction. So you can imagine the amount of difficulties Chinese construction companies face as they deal with powerful local authorities and the very strong land tenure laws in Indonesia. 
Now, another factor, another example that I'm going to give that, is, that has limited implementation is bureaucratic resistance. You see this in Thailand. For example, the State Railway of Thailand makes money by selling land, okay? But it loses money when it, when it does uh, rail operations. Hence, compensation for the loss of land is a key issue when the State Railway of Thailand um, and, and, and the government in Bangkok actually negotiate with the Chinese companies. Uh, there are also significant legal obstacles to the construction of the high speed railway uh, in, in, in Thailand from Bangkok to Nong Kai uh, uh, in the border regions with Laos. Um, uh, one, one significant law, legal, or some of these uh, legal obstacles are uh, labor laws, procurement standards, land usage, and environmental protection laws. So, to overcome these uh, legal barriers, Prayut, General Prayut, Prime Minister, Prayut actually had to invoke Article 44 to overcome these legal barriers. Now, the third point that I want to make is that for any infrastructure project, and especially for railways, which, cut, which cut, uh, cuts across many jurisdictions, having a champion is very important. In Malaysia, for instance, former Prime Minister Najib was a stalwart champion of the East Coast railing and the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Rail. However, when he lost power in May 2018, uh, January elections, these projects lost a powerful patron and was almost scuffled subsequently by, by uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Mahathir. Um, I think that uh, Ching Chu will, will you know, um, have more stories to tell later on. Uh, let me come to my last point. Uh, the last obstacle uh, that uh, happens when implementation comes about is that it's, it's technical. Um, this is where Laos is a very good example. Laos is a, is a very hilly and mountainous uh, country. So constructing a high-speed high railway in Laos is a huge challenge technically. Uh, because of terrain and geography, right? So it's a huge engineering project that requires tunneling through mountains, through hills, through rivers, okay? So in fact, a total of 170 bridges and 72 tunnels are expected to be constructed uh, in this whole uh, high-speed railway project in Laos. Moreover, there are large amounts of unexploded mines remaining from the Indochina walls. So uh, one very uh, rather rather funny, well, not quite funny as because the topic is, is serious, but uh, it was a quip from one uh, Chinese railway engineer working on the project. He actually said in quotes, we should have the US demine the area. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is one of the one of the uh, you know one of the interviews that we had. Now so in some there are actually significant challenges when, when China goes into Southeast Asia, whether it was in bargaining whether it's an implementation, uh, the, the image that smaller countries, secondary states have no agency. I think it's, it's, it's something that we did not see at all in the field work that we conducted through um, the Southeast Asian countries. Um, Cheng Tree, I think we'll, uh, I'll turn now to Cheng Tree, uh, who will elaborate on the diverse responses of uh, Southeast Asian countries to China and also the geopolitical and geoeconomics competition with other major powers. Um, thanks, Selena, and thank you, uh, Donald and Carla, for hosting uh, this event. Um, based on what had been presented by Mike and also Selena, let me just make uh, two quick points. Uh, one point is about internal and the other one uh, external, and that is uh, about the internal and external conditions that underpin smaller countries' uh, responses to China's railroad diplomacy or the broader uh, context of uh, China's Belt and Road-related uh, infrastructure diplomacy. So first thing first about the internal uh, conditions, and this is uh, the aspect that I'm going to uh, spend longer time. And for the second part, the uh, external conditions, I would uh, keep it brief depending on the time. So about the first point, the internal conditions, that's uh, really about domestic political factors that uh, really explain why smaller countries uh, have responded differently. Selena early on has already mentioned a number of uh, domestic internal conditions, such as, uh, for example, uh, the state capacity, the uh, location, and also uh, uh, public opinion. And I think all students of uh, political science would also uh, highlight a number of uh, other internal attributes, for example, uh, leadership, for example, 
domestic political systems and also state society relations. So for us, uh, for this book, we actually uh, try to uh, categorize all these internal attributes into two main variables. So you could see uh, from this uh, diagram, two times two uh, diagrams, we have uh, two uh, axes here. One is uh, what we call as a legitimation uh, axis. The other one, uh, pluralization. Before I go into uh, these two explanatory variables, those are what we call as uh, IV, independent variable. So before we talk about IV, let me uh, talk about DV, the dependent variable, the types of uh, responses. So here from this uh, two times two uh, matrix, you could see uh, very clearly um, about there are four types of uh, small state uh, responses to China's Belt and Road uh, Rail project, or in fact, for that matter, any big powers uh, infrastructure statecraft. So here we have uh, four types, and uh, you could see the examples that we use uh, are basically Laos, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. And even though uh, we focus just on uh, these four countries, I would say that uh, the typology and also the factors that explain all these differences apply to other ASEAN countries. And in fact, uh, for other smaller countries or secondary states uh, responses to uh, economic inducement when it comes to infrastructure interaction or partnership. So let me uh, highlight um, you know, um, these uh, four types. So the first type uh, allows represent uh, in the quadrant one, the enthusiastic uh, embrace. And then uh, the quadrant two, in the case of Malaysia, it's a uh, receptive, but with a cyclical recalibration. So meaning that these two uh, categories, they are more receptive than uh, the other categories of Thailand and Vietnam about China's back uh, infrastructure development. But the difference between Laos and Malaysia, quadrant one and two, is that uh, one, it's uh, more stable. Once decision is made, it would stay, it would continue. And that's uh, very much uh, represented uh, by the case of uh, Laos, whereby Malaysia, even though it's also very receptive, but you do see a kind of a cyclical recalibration and so adjustment whenever uh, there is a government or different uh, elites are coming to picture, you do see some differences adjustment. Early on, Selena mentioned about the case of uh, ECRL, East Coast Railing by uh, Mahadeo 2.0. And in fact, uh, by the time uh, Mahadeo's uh, Pakatan Harapan uh, government was replaced by the current Perikatan National Plus government, you do see uh, some adjustment again. So all these ongoing stories uh, certainly, uh, uh, I would say, uh, prove these uh, typologies of uh, quadrant one and quadrant two. And uh, let me very quickly uh, move on to uh, quadrant three and four. So as I mentioned earlier on, three and four represents those that are less receptive when compared to, uh, say, Laos and Malaysia. And the difference between them, again, uh, is that uh, one is more stable and then uh, the other one, um, uh, it's uh, subject to more flux fluctuations. And again, uh, Selena has mentioned about the case of uh, Thailand, the uh, sino Thaya project, the one uh, from Bangkok to uh, Korat and then from Korat to uh, uh, Nong Kai. You see that uh, this is a project that takes uh, years. We knew that, in fact, uh, when we were in Bangkok a few times, we have uh, talked to the elites uh, sharing with us the experiences that they have gone through over like 27, 28 rounds of negotiation. I uh, lost lost track, uh, I mean, uh, as to how many uh, negotiations that's going on, but clearly the empirical uh, records uh, indicates that so far the implementation is really a small section of uh, phase one from uh, Bangkok to uh, Korat, and phase two from Korat to Nong Kai is still uh, to a large extent uh, not really fully uh, decided. They are still uh, having a lot of uh, negotiations. So that's uh, Thailand's case that represent they are not as receptive as the case of uh, Laos and Malaysia, and it takes a long time. Uh, they, uh, they would engage uh, China's uh, railroad uh, inducement more selectively and also uh, in a protracted uh, journey. Whereby in the case of uh, Vietnam, Quadrant uh, 4, um, the type uh, we would uh, label it as limited involvement. Limited involvement in the sense that they keep the distance. So Vietnam is a very interesting, I would say, counterintuitive example in the sense that uh, if you look into a map, uh, that was uh, shown earlier on. Vietnam is actually a most proximate to uh, uh, China. And then uh, also in terms of economic interactions, Vietnam is by now the largest uh, trading partner of China in ASEAN region. You would think that by geographical and economic uh, logics, Vietnam should be uh, the one that is uh, most receptive about China's economic inducement. But the empirical, the fact, the reality is the opposite. It's a very limited involvement. Vietnam so far is only uh, having 
uh, one type of uh, real uh, project with China, that is uh, the intra-city uh, within the Hanoi. Also, uh, that went through a lot of protracted uh, process. So these two, these four types of uh, oh. state responses, I think uh, it's, uh, I would say, very interesting and very puzzling, clearly requires some explanation. And our explanation, as I mentioned earlier on, there are two explanatory variables. The most important one is uh, what we call as a legit legitimation. And all elites, regardless of political system, uh, try to uh, enhance and also justify their political authority. And uh, the way they do it uh, can be categorized into uh, three. There are three pathways of legitimation. The first type, uh, what I would call as uh, the three Ps. So the first P is about performance, the development-based uh, performance uh, legitimation. And second uh, type is uh, what I would call as the uh, procedural legitimation. It's uh, based on a democracy, uh, based on rule, rule of law. And the third one, very uh, tricky, but very prominent uh, these days is about the identity-based particularistic uh, legitimation that includes nationalism, xenophobia, so on and so forth. So these three uh, pathways of legitimation, performance, particularistic, and also procedure play a big part in explaining why all these uh, small, similarly situated uh, smaller states have responded uh, China's Belt and Road based uh, infrastructure differently. So our, our observation or our finding is that uh, we need to pay attention to the relative degree of uh, performance-based uh, legitimation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, either identity or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, procedural. That is the most important. So for Laos, for Cambodia, for Malaysia, where the ruling regime actually relies a lot about the economic performance as their main source of legitimacy and authority, they are more relatively and more receptive about China, China back uh, real, real, real and also other types of uh, infrastructure inducement. So in comparison of uh, Vietnam, um, you know, they have, uh, in, in, in addition, performance legitimacy clearly is uh, relevant. But in the case of uh, Vietnam-China context, the anti-China nationalism play a big part in uh, of actually offsetting or limiting as to uh, how far Vietnam's uh, ruling elites, regardless of the leaders, uh, should go. And in the case of Thailand, it's not so much about anti-China nationalism, but Thai uh, does have a strong sense of uh, identity. So it's about the uh, Thai wants to uh, keep the autonomy. So uh, in a lot of uh, interviews that we conducted, uh, a number of uh, policy elites, they shared with us that this is a, a Thai project, so it should be negotiated in Thai terms. So uh, at the moment, we might need uh, China externally and internally, but I think precisely because of the perceived dependency of the military regime on China, the more uh, the stronger reasons that the military uh, government in Thailand need to ensure that they are not uh, completely subjected, subjecting themselves to uh, China's uh, economic inducement. So this, uh, all these examples uh, show very clearly that uh, uh, the main explanatory variable of uh, uh, relative degree of development-based legitimation, it's uh, the most uh, important uh, variable. But that's not uh, all, because of uh, this variable also is being uh, conditioned by another relevant uh, factor, which is uh, what I've just mentioned about the degree of uh, power pluralization. And that's uh, really about how the political power in one country is uh, concentrated or contested across uh, inter-elites and also uh, state society relations. So in countries, uh, Laos and Vietnam, one party uh, state, once decision is made, either is yes or either is no, it will stay on. But in countries that are more contested, either is democracy or semi-democracy, any decision will be uh, subject to a uh, contestation, either through democratic process or either through uh, other uh, elite uh, contestation uh, on the street, so on and so forth. So with this, uh, let me uh, move on to uh, the second uh, issue that I wanted to uh, cover, which is uh, about the external conditions. And by that, I mean uh, the geoeconomics and also uh, geopolitical uh, dynamics that is uh, going on. Because even though the book really concentrates about the, uh, Malaysia, the Southeast Asian countries and also uh, China, but we understand that other powers in the region and outside of the region play a role as well. And interestingly, as we conduct and also conduct the research and also uh, proceed to the book uh, writings, a lot of uh, development have been uh, taking place, even as we talk. For example, I would group, uh, there are three types of alternative uh, scheme that have emerged by now 
uh, that uh, is being perceived in one way or another, either openly or, or uh, not openly, as an alternative or possible alternative to uh, China's Belt and Road real projects or infrastructure projects. So the first alternative, I would categorize them as the uh, quadrilateral, the quad uh, US and also uh, other quad members uh, infrastructure scheme. And the second type is what I would, uh, I would uh, categorize as the uh, EU connectivity uh, strategy. And the third type, interestingly, I would argue is the uh, China related, uh, China actually 2018 onwards proposed a new uh, arrangement, what they call as the third country cooperation. So third country in the sense that it's about China, host country, and another possible uh, country. And uh, Japan is very much a, a kind of a listed and a being uh, talked about as a possible uh, third country uh, partner. So I do think that these three arrangements are gaining momentum. Which one would gain uh, more prominent? I think uh, it's uh, yet to see, but uh, let's uh, just uh, take a few examples to uh, further illustrate the uh, uh, things that we observe uh, have been uh, happening. I think the best example would be a United States uh, um, mechanism. So early on, when we talk about the Quad-based uh, initiative, I would say it was uh, Japan, especially our base of uh, Japan uh, that hold a fort in trying to come up with a number of uh, arrangements uh, under the banner of uh, partnership for quality infrastructure to compete with uh, China. So this is being a play out most uh, prominently, I would say in the case of uh, Jakarta, Bandung, but uh, in fact, uh, in Thailand, in Malaysia, Japan factor is really a factor. So, but for the long time from 2013 to, uh, to from 2013, 14, 15, up until 2018, when Japan was the key uh, partner, but 2018 onwards, you do see United States and also uh, EU have also uh, joined this competition. So EU was uh, in uh, 2018 come up with this uh, EU Asia connectivity and United States at the same time uh, come up with the Build Act. And with that, we uh, saw that the last year, US have uh, together with uh, other quad members come up with the Blue Dot Network. And more recently, we also uh, in the midst of uh, COVID-19, we have also uh, uh, heard that uh, I mean, about the economic prosperity and network. So all this is expanding the competition on a, not just infrastructure, but also supply chain and competition. And all these geo-economic, geopolitical competitions, I think will go on. And I think it's uh, fair to say that China's uh, Belt and Road in Southeast Asia and beyond are clearly a kind of a catalyst that are provoking, inviting a lot of uh, competition that I've just uh, described. I would uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor Lanson, Selena, Ching Chui. Well, really, uh, quite you know, there's, 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 there's a lot to cover, and I think you did a fantastic job sort of giving us a bird's eye, bird's eye tour of the book, and I think it's uh, extremely well thought through and uh, very well organized. Uh, if I could just interrogate a little, challenge a little, uh, this starting proposition that integration, connectivity, uh, these benefits of infrastructure are, 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 are a given. Uh, I'll just mention two things, right? The first is that um, much of the Chinese railway infrastructure is in uh, archipelago, sorry, is, is in the mainland Southeast Asia. And of course, in Southeast Asia, the traditional divide has been archipelago Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and Malaysia and Singapore. And with mainland Southeast Asia, Thailand and the CLMV countries, uh, would these Chinese finance infrastructure, Chinese-led infrastructure projects actually deepen that, that divide uh, in Southeast Asia between the mainland south parts of Southeast Asia and the archipelagic, archipelagic parts of Southeast Asia. And to the extent that it does, how much does that eat into the integration connectivity benefits of uh, Chinese railroads? Uh, very interesting to me also, you didn't mention ASEAN at all. None of you mentioned ASEAN at all, because one of the original goals and still the goals of ASEAN is to hold Southeast Asia together, at least, uh, at least in uh, IR, international relations, and to deepen integration across uh, uh, the region. Uh, does, does, do these railroads um, signal the demise of ASEAN uh, and, 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 and a reversion, as it were, of the region to these two distinct uh, geographies, the maritime part of Southeast Asia and, and the archipelagic uh, parts of Southeast Asia. Also, uh, still on the question of whether infrastructure boosts integration, we know from the experience of high-speed rail uh, 
uh, real well in, in Japan, also in China, it, 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 is that it tends to concentrate wealth, resources, uh, what we call agglomeration effects. It tends to concentrate wealth, resources, talent, people in the major hubs. And so what is the impact of that in secondary cities uh, and, and minor cities, you know, uh, in Southeast Asia? Do you address that in the book? So I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on, on these two questions. Uh, maybe I'll take a stab at uh, the ASEAN part and let me count on my colleagues to um, uh, address the other questions you raised and uh, um, draw out implications in greater depth. Um, first of all, the book does talk a lot about, and, and a lot of our, or at least a significant fraction of our interviews were in multilateral organizations, usually representatives in the countries where we were interviewing. So there is quite a bit of talk about the role of ASEAN. Also, when uh, in my opening remarks, I said this is not an idea principally of Xi Jinping imposing on Southeast Asia, but this was a set of ideas that came out of both the colonial uh, experience before uh, World War II, and particularly in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and then it was adopted uh, in the post-World uh, War II era as uh, countries are taking shape and modernization occurring, uh, that the, when you got to ASEAN, you had the 2010 ASEAN connectivity plan and mm -hmm. so forth. Also, there's a lot of discussion of Mahathir's role and his vision. And when we interviewed him, uh, he talked a lot about growing up uh, and seeing the role that British railroads had played in his area in development. So I'd say the story of Mahathir is uh, very important. It's no accident that he in, uh, uh, put a blurb on the back of our book. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that, uh, and as uh, Selena said, uh, these countries have agency. And we shouldn't say just countries, but uh, to some considerable extent, re regional and sub-regional organizations play a role. So the book, I think, does uh, address those uh, issues. Uh, the, the other thing that I would say is that um, you mentioned, Donald, the agglomeration effect. Uh, and that's true. And that was sort of what we referred to as the field of dreams idea. Build the infrastructure and they will come. And where they will come is to nodes and cities and cities will raise educational and health levels and so on. But as we've seen in this whole globalization and modernization argument that we're now in and much of the population, not everybody benefits from this. So as part of the argument about this railroad system, for example, just put it sort of crudely, the faster the train, the fewer the stops, which means the faster the train, the more, I would say, the agglomeration effect. Right. So one of the big fights has been over what's the speed of the train and who's it designed to serve? Is it industry and freight or is it passengers and so forth? And so I would say, generally speaking, the Chinese came in with a vision of really fast trains, 250 kilometers and up, and all these negotiations on balance have slowed the system down. So I think you're right that agglomeration, inequality, and so on is, is one problem, but it also depends on the kind of system you build and also the surrounding political decisions you make. Uh, Mahathir, when he was in uh, after his May election in 2018, uh, negotiated on the line that Cheng Shui mentioned, the ECRL, uh, to get more stops and go through more provinces or states in Malaysia uh, to bring more benefits. So these benefits tend to get spread out as the negotiation process goes on. That's fantastic. Uh, with Selena or Cheng Shui? Yeah, let me just add. Um, just in case that uh, you know, we get the impression that we are we are very, we have a very rosy picture about. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in case anyone gets the impression that it's not so, because uh, that is, as uh, Mike was saying, there is a lot of inequalities uh, that will happen. And in fact, uh, when you read the story about even like um, in Malaysia, right, when they're trying to do the uh, the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Railway. Uh, you know, different states and cities are trying to get a piece of to be, you know, where the stations are, primarily because they don't want to be left out. 
And if you look at Laos, it's the same story that repeats itself. Uh, in Thailand, we do feel work because there are certain places that are afraid of just being left out, and meaning, meaning that they will not be developed, but, you know, and then their neighbors will develop much mm. more. Than them. So mm. these, these are the kind of phenomenon. Um, and also, I would just want to say, you know, our dedication, dedicated to the proposition that building connections is the future, uh, being wars as a past is actually really aspirational. <laughs> and, uh, trying to be inspirational here. So, um, you know, we recognize the problems of uh, ASEAN centrality here. I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, one of the things we noted is that the, the whole Pan-Asia Railway vision actually has very little uh, connection with the ASEAN master plan for 2025. Uh, I think they are starting work on trying to connect the two now, the infrastructure uh, program and the ASEAN master plan, the BRI and the master plan. But I think it's still in the early stages and we don't know how it's going to work out. And the other thing about the book is that, um, you know, the book is, is really the starting base where I think a lot of future work can come about, mm -hmm. building on what we have right now. This gives an entire picture of what's happening in the region in terms of a mega infrastructure project that, that is very ambitious that, link, that attempts to link uh, Kunming right down to Singapore. And then, you know, if, if you were talking about divisions between the upper valley big part of uh, Southeast Asia and the mainland part, uh, you are absolutely right in a sense that it could deepen, deepen the divisions. And that is what actually we have been worried about, right? The Mekong region versus the, the uh, maritime Southeast Asia part. Um, there's a, a, every possibility of that. But the fact that, you know, the possibility that, uh, I, I believe in our course of research, there was some talk of the possibility of connecting uh, what's happened in Indonesia to Singapore through some sort of a, a high-speed rail system. I don't know how serious anyone takes that kind of idea. Uh, it's going to be a tremendous and difficult uh, engineering uh, project. Um, but these are the kind of problems that we face. I mean, there is that issue there, and, and it is not, um, you know, all wonderful. And, yeah. Good. Ching Tree, do you have... I, if my, if my, my, I may uh, add the two points, one uh, sh short answer to uh, Donna's question and, a and the other one uh, slightly uh, longer. The short answer to your question uh, is that because the nature of this infrastructure development is very much by the host country. So it has to be a national decision. And when China or other external partners are coming in, then it becomes a bilateral. So ASEAN uh, as a regional organization does not uh, really play a role when it comes to uh, this kind of national infrastructure projects. And the slightly uh, more elaborated answer is that I think the best uh, way to conceive all these uh, infrastructure and connectivity partnership, either involving two or more countries, is really to see uh, that as a concentric layer of cooperation. Concentric layer of cooperation, meaning that uh, in addition to national and bilateral that I mentioned, you could also see uh, some sub-regional and also a uh, regional. Uh, Mike uh, early on uh, mentioned about the uh, SKRL, Singapore Kuming Rail Link. This is a perfect example uh, that actually, in a way, uh, kick off uh, this whole uh, dynamics of uh, cross-border rail connectivity project. Because of, we know that despite the name, Singapore Kuming, the initiative is not proposed uh, by China or Singapore, but by another country. Malaysia. It was the Mahadir in December 1995 that proposed that during the ASEAN meeting. And a few months later, he actually, uh, um, in addition to uh, the initiative, actually uh, uh, put in some money and also diplomatic resources to actually institutionalize a mechanism that uh, is not uh, well talked about, but we know uh, even until today, from 1996 until now, with a short break uh, during Asian financial crisis, every year, the transport ministers of uh, all these seven ASEAN countries plus China, uh, mm -hmm. take place uh, and discuss about how to uh, build this uh, real network of uh, Singapore coming really. And uh, despite the name, it's not about like uh, constructing a new uh, railroad, but it's actually about connecting, uh, you know, building about the missing links, building about the uh, spur lines, and also uh, the double tracking of uh, the real railroad. So mm -hmm. all this uh, uh, has actually started uh, much earlier. So this uh, story also uh, shows us that we have been uh, putting a lot of uh, information about big power push, China push. We actually overlook, overlook uh, the, the fact that uh, sometimes and more often than not, small countries uh, try to pull. So in uh, SKR and many other examples, uh, Laos, uh, Thailand, Laos, uh, China, Thailand, China, small states were actually the one who pulled in uh, China to collaborate precisely because of on our own, either uh, individual ASEAN countries or ASEAN as a whole, we are not able to uh, really uh, 
turn all these initiative, connectivity initiative into reality. We have uh, taken uh, more than 20 over years. SKRL's uh, journey is a clear example as to uh, why we are talking about demand and supply of uh, infrastructure partnership. Belt yeah. and Road will be a part of the, part, uh, of the supply, but uh, all those uh, alternative uh, schemes that I talk about, I think will increase the, su the supply precisely because of at the regional level, national level, there have always been some demands. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's one of the main arguments uh, of the book that you know, small states, small countries have more agency than we give them credit for. And, and, and especially small states, uh, you know, exercising as much leverage as they have and acting somewhat collectively can uh, bring about very different outcomes. Uh, and, and of course, when we talk about BRI, the tendency is to view China as this hegemon, right, imposing that trap diplomacy. And I think what your book challenges that, that, uh, that, that myth, right, that, that it, it is a one-way street. Uh, we've got a couple of related questions. In fact, we've got quite a good few a good questions on the Q&A box. Uh, so one is a technical one, and then Selena talked about the technical challenges. So how does China ensure that the system is fully integrated technically, right, with different countries? So this is about technical integration. Uh, with disparate countries and other geopolitical powers all buying a slice of, uh, of the real network. That's one. The second question which I have, which is somewhat related, is another of the challenges has been local reaction, which I think both Selena and Chengchui alluded to. Uh, and the parallel is with Africa, where local populations, according to the, uh, the question of Mark McFarlane, local populations have resented China when it's built railways and not delivered you know, the spillover benefits. A lot of China's rail activities have been seen to benefit principally China. And not Africa. Uh, have have you all seen, observed similar resentment, similar concerns in Southeast Asia, or is the distribution of benefits more balanced uh, uh, in, in Southeast Asia? Well, I might just uh, take an initial stab, and um, my colleagues will have examples. Um, uh, I think there have been uh, a number of things. We talked to, uh, I won't mention uh, the name of the person or the locality but a local leader in Malaysia. And uh, uh, that locality would play an important role in uh, if a certain line was constructed, also has the presence already of um, the collateral Chinese industries related to railroad like rolling stock factories and so on. So whole nother part of this is not just the railroad itself and displacing people through land and environmental issues. Mm -hmm. It's also bringing in collateral industries and development and how big a right of way does China have and what commercial development. Also, what is the collateral that these countries put up if they can't make the uh, debt repayments, particularly in Laos? Do, do, does, does Laos have to cede um, uh, plantation land for Chinese use for a certain period of time? So uh, there are all these aspects of negotiation and every time there's a negotiation in one of these countries, of course, there are winners and losers within uh, that that country. Uh, issues that were particularly uh, sensitive were land acquisition because it involves displacement. And an interesting case was in Indonesia where the Air Force owned land through which the proposed Chinese railroad was going to go. And of course, uh, not only the presidential airplane happened to be at this base, but uh, uh, other security sensitive issues. And so you don't not, not only have popular uh, resentment and reaction, but you also have interest group uh, reaction in all these countries. The uh, Thai Rail Administration in Thailand is a huge interest group that sees its interests affected. So I would say at every step of the way, and each of these countries has a different pattern of interest groups and effects, but there is controversy continually. In Laos, our interviewees talked about some of the um, concerns peasants had about compensation for their land, resentment that the government didn't consult adequately, and so forth. I just conclude by saying my impression is 
that China is trying to learn from previous negative experiences and minimize it. But the, as the book emphasizes, each one of these countries is a separate negotiation with a separate set of uh, hurdles and obstacles. And so while China learned, say, from its experience in Laos, that isn't a fully comparable to what it has to do to engineer a project in Thailand. So. China is trying to learn, but as it learns, it is dealing with a new situation every time it moves from country to country. So uh, that'd be where I'd start, but I'd be interested in what my colleagues have to say. Yeah, I think I've actually, uh, I, I, if I may, I actually, um, I think I spoke quite a bit on, on the public opinion. Uh, generally, the, the sentiment is negative, even in a country like Laos. Uh, there were a lot of concerns about whether people, uh, local workers are going to benefit, uh, what are the implications uh, for displacement uh, of, of uh, villages that have been displaced? And uh, there were some quarrels over compensation issues, which actually delayed um, the land acquisition uh, as well. Um, those are all detailed in the book. So there are a lot of problems on the ground. Now, I'm going to try and take a step on the engineering uh, question about how the different disparate bilateral projects are going to link up into the whole thing. And Mike, uh, I think you're a better engineer than I am. So you might have to help me with this answer if I didn't get it right. So <laughs> uh, from what I understand, from our, what we understand is that you know, the standard gauge is about one, point, one meter. And then the high-speed railway is about 1.4 meters. So if you generally build 1.4 meters, somehow the system will link up. Uh, this is a non-engineer speaking. For example, let me give you an example, right? So, in, in Jakarta, in, in uh, the Jakarta Bandung Railway, Jokowi has been now talking about extending from Bandung to Surabaya. And the Japanese uh, other ones are slated to build the Bandung Surabaya stretch, meaning that somehow the high speed railway technology, uh, it is, it can be made compatible. Now, so along the, along the way, as we try and ask engineers how this can be done, another answer that we've been given is that if they don't match up, what they'll do is they're going to carry the train and move it to the next track. But this is how it's done. So again, this is a non-physics, non-engineering person speaking. Uh, Mike, if I get it wrong, could you uh, correct me and, and give the right answer to the, to the audience? <laughs> am I right? Well, I'm not an engineer either, but I am interested in this is a Real very important question. Uh, so uh, certainly this question of link up, uh, how do you make it interconnected and most efficient? Because the whole idea is to speed up the flow of people, resources, information. And so every time you cross a political or national boundary, there's a, a, an intrinsic barrier of, or barriers of all sorts. And so at the same time, you're trying to build a, a physical system that is the tracks and it, there, they're not going to link up if one railroad system's a meter wide on the separation of tracks and the other's 1.435 meters. So that's the sort of physical. But equally challenging for a political system is making it hook up in regulatory terms mm -hmm. for customs. And that, Donald you, and your audiences, importantly in Hong Kong. Look at the problem you had figuring out on the high-speed railroad from Guangzhou. Should there, where should customs be? Should the Chinese, the PRC, have police enforcement powers in the center of Hong Kong at the railroad station? Look at that. Hung it up for what? A couple of years. That just that argument. Well, look at trying to move across, uh, you know, eight national administrative different regulatory systems and so on. So it's a it, this hookup is not just a, it's a hardware hookup and it's a software hookup. Mm. Well, th thanks very much, uh, uh, Mike, uh, Selena, and Cheng Chui. I'm afraid that's more or less the time we had. I just want to end with some uh, comments uh, uh, from, from the Q&A box. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, of our audience said, you know, congrats on such, congratulations on such a transnational book. Uh, and you know, he, he was curious to ask, was there anything surprising that you discovered using such a transnational approach? And I think both uh, Sadina and Chengtui talked about you know, the, the determinants of, of, uh, of, you know, uh, of how much bargaining power a state has. 
I like Cheng Tree's two by two framework on pluralization and legitimation. Uh, so, so I think those were things you, uh, you all discovered. Uh, so, so lots of uh, other interesting questions also. Uh, yeah, maybe that we'll end on this. And, and we really have to keep this short. Uh, what do you think would be the impact of the pandemic on financing? I think although the BRI hasn't been, been, been postponed or shelved, I think we can all agree that it's probably going to be delayed, right? Then and there's going to be a shift away from uh, big ticket infrastructure projects to more, you know, uh, transfer of technical expertise. You know, uh, Chinese really put a spotlight on the digital part of the BRI as well as the health BRI. Uh, so, so do you think the pandemic would change in any way the China's calculations on? Or, or not just China's, but also Southeast Asia's uh, countries' calculations about the viability and long-term sustainability of these railways. Well, uh, that's entirely possible, uh, but there's another way of looking at it, and which I think China's doing in its general approach to the world, and that is, you know, the United States and uh, EU and so on all have their own problems, their own uh, self-preoccupations. Uh, uh, and this is the moment where China actually has, relatively speaking, come through this, at least as of now, in good shape, uh, relatively good shape. It came through the global financial crisis in relatively good shape. So in a kind of way, there's a thinking in China, every crisis is an opportunity for us to make up uh, lost ground. So I think that'll be one uh, impulse in China. On the other hand, as we point out in the book, there's a big debate about domestic needs and certainly COVID raises the issue of relative allocation of money outside China versus inside China. So I think the impulse to be more selective on programs, do um, more well thought out programs, less uh, risky ones, uh, that there'll be more caution. But I think there is that impulse that this is the moment for China to um, move up in relative terms. And so, yes, I think there'll be retrenchments. And I would just end, this is maybe more a hope than a, a prediction, uh, but that maybe at this moment, we're, I don't wanna say overestimating the long-term effects of COVID, but I think things will look different once where there's a globally available vaccine uh, and there will be, I think, uh, not abandonment of every idea that existed prior to COVID. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, Donald, may I, may I add? Um, so just, um, I actually want to give an example. I mean, Laos, uh, the Vientiane Bo to Botan uh, high-speed railway was only delayed for 23 days. Obviously, Laos have a less of a COVID problem. But the delay, I mean, but they rely on Chinese workers, right? Across the borders and all that. So if, if it's any indication that the project was only delayed by 23 days and mm -hmm. they are still on uh, in time to finish the project in 2020, 2021, 2023, I'm sorry, it escaped my mind. But they're on time to finish the, the project. Um, and I think that the, that the hunger for infrastructure is still there. So while COVID is playing out, and I, I agree with Mike that I think generally not everything is going to change. There will still be that hunger and that thirst for infrastructure that other countries have not been able to provide for Southeast Asia. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge uh, Professor Ye Ming's question. Professor Ye Ming uh, from Boston University is a friend. Uh, she, that was a question about a transnational uh, approach to, to, um, to the book. Well, I think that one of the differences in taking of just a solely US perspective or a Chinese perspective, or even like a regional ASEAN kind of perspective is that um, the, for us living in the region, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether anything is really surprising uh, in a sense, because we live in the region and we know that how different each country is. But if you're coming from a country, like, a big country like the United States, if you come from a big country like uh, China, you know, uh, the, when you look at, Countries in Southeast Asia, you think of, you tend to think of them as one uh, monolith, as, as one, 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 well, how do I put it? One, one type, right? But as, as, as we discover, and uh, well, not so much for me and Cheng to discover, but uh, the differences are there and so are the similarities. And what this kind of cross-national uh, project actually facilitate comparisons on several levels. 
on the differences and the similarities in the way that we view infrastructure, the way that we view uh, China as a power, and the way that we view external powers as well, uh, including the United States. Um, you can really see the diversity uh, instead of just uh, attributing one set of behaviors to small states. And uh, in, in cross-border projects in particular, you can actually see how a foreign power can penetrate across borders into the domestic politics of these smaller states and the impact and effects they produce. I think these are some of the key things that we find, but um, I wouldn't say that it really surprises any of us actually in this group. Um, Cheng Chui and I are from the region. Uh, Mike is not from the region, but he has deep knowledge of the region. So I wouldn't say that it actually surprises us that much. Mike is an honorary South Asian. Cheng Chui. <laughs> He's an honest Singaporean. I'll confess, I was running up. surprised. <laughs> Let me just uh, make two uh, very quick points. Uh, one is quick clarification, and then uh, the other one, a quick point just to uh, adding to the discussion. The quick clarification is about the two times two uh, metrics that you mentioned. I'm glad that you like it. But the clarification is, is that uh, this is a collective uh, effort by all three uh, authors. Mike himself has been uh, writing about the pluralizations uh, years ago in the context of uh, China. And then the quick point that I would like to uh, make uh, really is about the uh, uh, earlier issue of uh, that trap uh, that you actually uh, raised. I think I have always uh, thought that uh, that threat really, it's a very powerful narrative, but might not uh, really as a very useful or comprehensive or analytical tool to uh, capture the dynamics because whether or not it's a debt trap or not really depends on uh, the financial uh, arrangement. Whether is that about loan or about investment and whether or not the, the detail uh, about the PPP, uh, public, mm -hmm. private, the uh, partnerships, so, and forth, so forth. So uh, all these uh, issues, I think uh, you do see and observe uh, some variations across uh, the region, yeah. No, I also agree on the debt trap part. I mean, as Keynes, John Maynard Keynes said about 100 years ago, if you owe the bank 100 pounds, you have a problem. If you owe the bank, the bank a, a, a million pounds, the bank has a problem. With many of these projects, China is the banker. It has as much right. to lose, if not more to lose, uh, than the parties it is lending to. Uh, so I, I agree with you on the debt trap diplomacy. It's a very simplistic narrative, uh, which appeals to this demonization narrative of, uh, of, of China. And, and as, as all of you so eloquently put it, uh, the reality is a lot more nuanced. Uh, it's a lot more differentiated. Uh, and I really want to congratulate uh, all three of you for putting together such a timely book, uh, such a at, at a time when we are, you know, saying what you know we, we tend to be very pessimistic about prospects after the pandemic. Here's one example where you know, with infrastructure, with more much needed investments in infrastructure, uh, we can get the region to be a shining example, right, of of uh, of growth, of development, of of uh, of integration. Uh, at a time when you know we're so concerned about the divisions caused by identity politics, by nationalism, by particularism, so this this potentially not just a game changer, but but something which would boost uh, development and 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 uh, and equality also uh, across Southeast Asia. So, congratulations, one like once again.